Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, let me change this thing here. I can make it work. We'll go to there. So in case you were expecting something different, this is supposed to be on woodworking, SketchUp's features for woodworking. When um, Aiden asked me to do this, we were talking about doing sort of a top 10 features uh, for woodworkers. And um, as I worked through this, it seemed like uh, there wasn't an order and the top 10 list seemed like it should, you know, like a David Letterman top 10, uh, seemed like it should have an order. So there is no order to the features that I'm going to talk about, and hopefully that's all right. Uh, for those who don't know who I am, uh, where have you been? Um, <laughs> I've been using SketchUp for, well, 10 years last month. Um, and uh, teaching it for about eight. Uh, I write on a blog called Design Click Build on the Fine Woodworking website, and I do plans for them for projects that they feature in the uh, magazine. And I also do drawing work for other clients, and that's not my day job. My day job is taking care of critical life support equipment for Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. So uh, this is all side stuff. Um, when Aiden asked me to do this, he also asked me if I use layout, and I told him that uh, SketchUp and layout are all I need. Um, well, in this paddle game. So SketchUp and layout in this paddle game are all I need. And this remote control. Um, uh, so anyway, sorry about that. That was just, um, just the... The intro, Aiden and I went through that thing um, early on, so I thought I'd throw that in there. Uh, so as far as features, I don't, where, I mean, it's kind of hard to answer this in a, in a large group, but I see faces here of people I know who know SketchUp better than I do and probably use it in more of a power way than I do. Um, but I don't know where, are some people pretty new to SketchUp. Um, Okay, um, well this is going to be sort of uh, the gospel of SketchUp according to Dave. And I'll tell you some things, uh, it's what I find works well for my uh, workflow. Nearly everything that I draw is what I'll classify as fine woodworking. It's not, mostly not kitchen cabinets, not that there's anything wrong with those. Um, it's one-off pieces, uh, like the stuff that was going in the slideshow. Um, and so I'm looking at this from kind of that, mostly from that uh, vantage point. But if you're not a SketchUp Pro user, some of these things, like uh, I'm going to start with the solid tools, which um, admittedly I don't use an awful lot, um, but this is a really powerful tool for SketchUp. Um, this is sort of the layout for a chair that I recently drew. In fact, it's featured in the current issue of Fine Woodworking uh, as a chair by Michael Fortune. And um, these are the, in the back here, we've got the backrest slats, which I've already made up, and they're already components. Um, and I'm just going to real quickly, normally I don't make components of things like I did for these slats um, ahead of time, but I had to keep geometry from uh, intersecting with other geometry in uh, for the other scenes that I've got here. So, and I'm not going to bother with a name, I'm just going to make that a component. I'm just going to demonstrate this real quickly, and I'm not going to do all these slats, but this shows the setup for this thing. Um, so this slat, the thing that I pushed up vertically, uh, is the, that's basically the plan view of that slat. Evidently, I've deleted one of the slats at some point screwing around with this model. So, um, and then the bottom edge of this curve, well, actually, the, the whole thing is the thickness of the seat slat and with its bend. And kind of a cool way to, um, make this 
the final seat slat would be to use the solid tools. Uh, pardon me. Notes. So if we um, use, and you can tell I don't use this enough to remember which one is in, I want to intersect um, for this. If we intersect these two, and we've got a slap. And so, um, actually what I would do for that, let me undo that, is, uh, actually let's do it this way. I'm gonna do a Command C, since I'm on a Mac, could be Control C on um, the PC. And I just copied that uh, piece to the clipboard. So then I can use intersect, make that slat. Okay. Keyboard shortcuts, by the way, are a huge benefit. Um, so I'm doing a lot of stuff with keyboard shortcuts. The other thing is edit paste in place, which I have a keyboard shortcut for. So there's another feature that I just find incredibly powerful. Copying something, pasting it somewhere else, or in another context, or keeping it and putting it back where it came from uh, in the, um, exactly the same place without having to, to monkey around. So if I use intersect again, now I've got the next slat. Um, so that's a pretty cool thing. Um, another, here's another place where uh, solid tools kind of come in handy. If you want to cope, say, this piece of crown molding, uh, you can use the other one and make sure I'm using the, we use, actually, let's do it this way. Um, we use trim, and we'll use this one to trim that one, and open that one for editing, and I can deselect all the waste. One of the things, too, about SketchUp, and as far as woodworking is concerned, is um, I think a lot of the operations can have analogies in the shop. So here I just created that coped joint using the solid tools and there was a waste side and uh, the side you keep and that worked out pretty slick. Um, I will tell you one of the things that I do, not everybody agrees with this, but everything that I make is a component. I don't use any groups. Solid Tools converts components to groups. So then I have to unmake that or make that back into a component to continue with my workflow. So I only use Solid Tools when the time savings of making it back into a component um, pays off. If it's a simple thing like cutting a mortise um, in a table leg, I wouldn't use the Solid Tools. I'd use push-pull or some other. I have other methods for that. Um, Follow me, another big tool. Uh, by the way, if you have questions, just ask. Solid Tools is a plugin. Solid Tools is a feature that is included with SketchUp Pro. It comes with that. Uh, it does Boolean operations. There are other ways, and I'll show another way to do similar things as we go along here. Um, follow me. If you're, anybody um, use a lathe here? frequently. So uh, you want to make turned parts. Um, you can draw a path and a profile and we'll use follow me and it's going to process for a little bit here um, because I intentionally put a lot of detail in some of these curves. Um, and we've got a turned vessel, whether that's a pretty one or not, I'm not going to make that judgment. I, don't, I, I just pulled this shape out of my head when I was setting this thing up. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out, and this is one of these things where I, I leverage uh, components. There's a hole. There's actually several holes in here. We're looking down into the 
um, vase, and you'll see that the bowl is floating above the ball, which is floating above the base, which is probably kind of cool. And most people wouldn't ever notice that um, if you just show them a drawing like this. But let's undo the oh, command Z. There we go. We'll undo this. Here's one of the things with components. One of the, this is probably, in my mind, is probably one of the best features in SketchUp. Uh, I'm going to make a copy of that component with the Move tool. And let's select it and hit the Scale uh, tool. And I'm going to scale that up by a factor of, oh, let's say 1,000. So now you see the original is down here where I left it. And we'll use Zoom Extents. Whoops, I want to open that component for editing, and I'll run Follow Me again. It won't be any faster, but when we get done, there won't be the gaps that I had before. So if we look at that ball, you can see the little neck in there. It's all attached. Uh, let's get up here. There's no hole in the bottom. Now if I close that and delete it and hit Zoom Extents, uh, one of my, oh, my molding piece got, when the solid uh, tool got done with it, um, it threw that out on uh, layer zero so it's still visible. But notice here's my originally sized bowl and there's no hole and there's no uh, gap between the bits. So it's with, yeah. Is that just a workaround for the small model problem? Yeah, and what we're running into is um, a tolerance issue. SketchUp um, doesn't do little tiny faces very well. And so, yeah, that's a workaround for when you're going to do something that's going to create a lot of little tiny faces make them big. The thing is, we're tricking SketchUp into to, uh, creating those little faces, even though it doesn't really want to do it. Uh, uh, about a thousandth of an inch. So it's, it's pretty tiny, but it, that will rear its head in things like knobs. If you're doing any hardware drawings, you run into that. Um, this is a, admittedly a little tiny um, bowl. That was intentional just to make sure I had something. You know, here we've got, you know, it's three and a half inch, yeah. So it's not very big. Well, this is the original that I did, and it had the holes and the, the gaps. But I made a copy. I, because it's a component, I could copy it, scale up the big copy. And you could do this without making the component, but you'd scale up, and then you'd scale back down. If, so I'm leveraging the component thing where you edit one component and the other components get edited at the same time. Yeah. Now, you have to scale with the component, that copy, not open for editing. Because if you open it for editing, you're modifying the geometry inside, which modifies all of them. Um, and if you, don't, if you choose to scale up and then scale back down so you don't make a copy like I do, um, you want to make sure you use the same handle that you dragged up to drag back down so the thing ends up back in the same place. Because that's the other thing that's really cool here is my original bowl stayed where I started with it. Sometimes I'm drawing a part in place on another part and I want it to stay there. I don't want to have to move it over and work on it, you know, scale it up and work on it, and then move it back into place. So I don't have to move it at all. Um, so, follow me again. Um, I'm not going to, I won't run this, but this is just the setup for drawing one of these bin poles. Um, actually, both of these bin poles, I, I actually recently did a, a blog post on drawing this one on the left. Um, so, if you want to watch that video, you can. Uh, but 
one of the things that I find helpful is being able to figure out how to break something down into smaller units and then uh, to be able to work with it. Uh, a lot of people say that SketchUp doesn't handle curves, and yes, we know they aren't real curves. They're um, a lot of facets. Um, but I don't really think that's a huge problem uh, in most cases, at least for my application uh, in SketchUp. All right, this is a called a hayrake table. Uh, Michael Pekovich designed this. Pardon me, I'm going to delete that thing. Get it out of the way. Um, this has some interesting features. Um, these sort of stop chamfers, and especially the ones on the curves. Uh, kind of an interesting thing. Again, I, I mentioned earlier I have, um, I can make a lot of analogies between tools in SketchUp and tools in the woodworking shop. And here's one of those um, applications. So here's a blank version of that um, curved end piece. And to cut that chamfer, I draw a path for follow me and a profile. So here, this green triangle is my um, router cutter, right? And just like with a router, uh, you don't hold it up against the wood and then turn it on. That's a good way to have the router ripped out of your hand. Um, and, or you don't hold it up on the router table and you know, maybe get a finger in the bit. Um, you start the cutter off the part, you know, spinning before and cutting before it contacts the wood. And so um, there's my profile. It's inside out. By the way, I use this green as a back face color uh, so that little tiny holes like in that bowl, it was very easy for me to see that as opposed to um, the default shaded or blue-gray color that can, can very often look like, you know, this gray depending on your screen. Um, but so here I've got this shape and I um, can, since this thing needs to get a chamfer on the bottom, as you can see in the background there, I've got the cutter already now made. So if I copy that down, and I'm just going to copy it down here somewhere. It doesn't matter for the moment. And I'm going to use flip along the blue direction. This is a mirroring operation. If you're not familiar with this, this is another really powerful tool for SketchUp users. Um, most furniture is symmetrical somehow, either left and right or top and bottom or uh, whatever. And mirroring is a good way, and I'll show some more of that, I think, in a little bit here. But I'm going to flip that along the blue direction and mirror that um, geometry. And then I have the line here, so I can just move that up. I'm not going to make you watch me do all the cutting on this, but I'll just show you my process here. So I've selected both. I, by the way, I use a triple click with the select tool to get all of that stuff, if you're not familiar with that operation. That's a good thing to know. And I'm going to use Control X or C Command X to cut that. And I'm going to open this component for editing. I'll show you with the, um, with the menu here. And I'll use Edit, Paste, in Place. And now that geometry is inside the component. And if I select the geometry of the um, part, right click and choose intersect faces. And we can do this with model because there isn't anything else there to, to intersect. I've now cut that. And the reason that, actually let's delete some stuff here quick. And again, I, because the, and I was just about to mention that, the shape that I created was not solid. And I could have screwed around with, um, with making it solid, but the effort involved is greater than, for me, and my thinking process is greater than um, this uh, requires. Let's just, yes? What makes that shape not solid? 
Uh, there are some places where um, it folds over on itself and you end up with um, edges. One of the things that defines a solid is that every single edge has to be shared between two faces. No more and no less. That's probably the simplest way to think about what it takes to make a solid. So if you have a hole, there's an ed there are edges that are only bounding one face, right? And so um, that, uh, that's the sort of thing in, you know, you can go around and clean that stuff up, but is there value in doing that or is it better to just get on with it using some other tool? And so I won't take the time to delete all the geometry here, but you can see I've got the, the stop cham for cut. Um, and I just have a little cleanup work to do to, to erase geometry. Um, again, in my head, that works out like a router. And yeah, okay, I gotta clean up some sawdust. All right. Um, so, th does that make sense, what I did there? Can I see the original path and the triangle? Uh, yeah, let's do a command Z, we'll go all the way back. No, that's okay. So, one thing I didn't mention is that um, SketchUp, uh, with the follow me tool, requires that the profile be perpendicular to the starting leg of the path, and it will end perpendicular to the last leg of the path, or segment in the path. Um, if you put a profile in that's not perpendicular, SketchUp will project it. It doesn't rotate it when you start the follow me tool. It makes a projection, which changes the shape of the uh, projection. That would be more noticeable in the case of um, some profile that's got curves in it. And if you think about a lot of molding planes, uh, the old style molding planes, if you're familiar with those, they'd have the, the iron would be skewed so the shape that the, of the iron, you can't just hold it up to the molding this way and have it match. It's got to be skewed. Um, and so you're running a projection of that. Uh, so by starting out here, I've got this straight segment that, uh, that I set the profile perpendicular to. Um, by the way, uh, Chris Fulmer did a plug-in that will put a uh, face on a, an endpoint perpendicular, which is really handy. Um, I usually forget I've got it on my computer and construct the, the perpendicular instead. Um, but whatever you do, that's kind of a key thing is to get that to be perpendicular. Any other questions about that? How did I create the path? Um, I don't remember. No. Um, <laughs> So to get the long arc, what I did is I opened my uh, component for editing and I selected this edge and I copied it and then I got outside the component. Couldn't you just offset it? Well, that's what I did, but I didn't want it inside the component. And I, I, so I isolated it. So by, you know, I'll do that. So I've selected it. Command C or Control C to copy, get outside, and edit paste in place. Again, my keyboard shortcut. So there's the, that edge now, and it's outside the component. And the reason I work outside the component is I can do anything I want outside, and I don't risk um, destroying the part that I'm really going to work on. So uh, I'm going to use offset. Again, I've got a keyboard shortcut. I'll offset this in a little farther um, just to show you. But there's the long part of the arc. The curves here are based on the radius of the cutter. Um, and then I just added these little line segments um, out running off the part at each end of the thing. And the nice thing is, like, these segments at the end, the length really doesn't matter. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of like you can draw a board any length you want and cut it down and you're not wasting any wood. Um, it doesn't matter how long those are as long as they're long enough to get the 
that cutter profile off the part. Does that make sense? It just naturally takes care of itself in that um, follow me operation because of the where the profile is cutting through. So this edge is um, cutting in right at the corner and making that turn. So again, if I, let me get rid of my offset there. So if I run that follow me operation again, oops, okay, after I, um, did all that, my profile um, was exploded after running follow me. So I'll correct that, um, I think. Oh, I know what my problem is. Let's get rid of that copied in line and now I can delete all that stuff. I just, uh, again, a keyboard shortcut, but I welded most of it together. This doesn't happen to me when I'm uh, working by myself and just and only talking to myself. Uh, all right. Do you have more fun drawing it or building it? The problem is I don't get a much, as much time to work in my woodworking shop. Somehow it get, always gets dirty, but um, I don't have as much time to work in the shop as I used to because I'm doing all this drawing for other people. Um, okay, so there's the follow me thing. Um, and so that path is just coming in and cutting, sweeping right through. Oh. Well, in this case, I'm not. If you look at what I did here, these were cut um, this way. That it just comes in naturally with this curve like this. The way I'm running the follow me tool. So. Um, and on the original, oh, I didn't cut off, I didn't delete all the geometry um, when I did that. Here, we'll put that back in there and I'll. Um, And just putting the, well, first you have a face. Um, perpendicular. Yeah. So then I just, um, I set out a guideline at, with the yellow tape uh, protractor yeah. at 45 degrees yeah. and I just drew a triangle that was much bigger than what I need for the cutter. So that's another thing is your cutter can be huge if needed. Um, it doesn't have to stop at the, in fact it's better if it doesn't stop at the top yeah. and it's better if it goes quite a ways beyond because it makes it easier to select the waste that you have to get rid of. So. Um, so if we do an edit paste in place and select all this geometry and intersect faces with model and we'll delete that and let's get rid of some more junk there and that. And you see here's one of those little things that would have made that um, not be solid right there in that corner. Um, maybe. Uh, to be honest with you, I haven't tried that with that particular shape. I'm not sure it would delete that stuff in the inside and make it solid. Probably end up with a hole. Um, yeah. Well, if you, I, it might work if you just did that on the, the green thing, the cutter, instead of you, before you put it in here. Yeah. But you see how that's cut now? Um, it was that, it's your breakfast. Um, no, it doesn't, but the router wouldn't do that either because the router would come off that way. Oh, in the table? Yeah. Probably a little different position on the, um, the way I did the cutter. I, did the, I drew this table um, three or four years ago, so uh, you're right. 
that does have that uh, profile. Now that you re remind me of that, I do remember that I thought about this for a long time uh, and screwed around with it to make it look right. Uh, it can be done. How about that? Uh, let's move on because I'm going to get kicked out of here pretty soon. Um, here's another thing. This is obviously this is that di uh, diagonal rail, and the rail has on the end of the tenon has chamfers on it. Um, by the way, most of everything I'm doing here is done with the native tools. We don't need a lot of plugins to do an awful lot of this stuff. And I'm not saying that there isn't value in plugins because there's huge value in plugins. But what I would recommend if you're just getting to grips with SketchUp is learn what you can do with the native tools um, before you start diving into the plugins. It'll also help you understand what SketchUp is doing and when things don't go the way you think they ought to. Um, you'll have a better idea what's why that is. Is this with the free or the pro version? Except for the stuff with the solid tools, everything I'm showing here could be done with the free version. Um, is that okay that I said that, or they should buy the pro version so they... Um... <laughs> so, if you want to put a chamfer on the end of that um, uh, tenon, this is a 3 8 inch wide, whoop, no it's not, it's 3 16 inch wide chamfer. Um, we can just use offset and the auto fold function of the move tool. So what I've done here is just the top part of this thing. Uh, actually I'm going to lay out the rest of it and I'm going to do the entire chamfer in one, uh, one go. Here I'm going to just use the move tool, the copy function of the move tool. And, whoops, you're right. I'm also used to a screen that's a whole lot bigger, and I sit like this. It's like sitting in the front row of the movie theater um, when I'm working at home. All right. So, uh, move, copy, and we'll do the offset on the bottom here. Here's another way to select those edges is, I double click on the face and then hold shift and deselect the face and the edge that I don't want included for the offset. Get offset with keyboard shortcut, double click, and I've got the end of the chamfer laid out. Now we'll switch to using the select tool, select these edges, and get the move tool. Again, keyboard shortcuts. Um, on the Mac, you'll notice it says Command equals Auto Fold down here. Those tips are really handy when you can't remember or when you're working between platforms. And if I start that back and type 3 16 which is the same offset I had um, for the lines that I drew, I now have a pretty painless chamfer all the way around this thing. Now, oh, 10 minutes? Oh, golly. Um, so, there we go, I better hurry because I've got more stuff to show. Uh, we're we're going to skip some of these things or I won't uh, describe them too much. Here's an uh, intersect op operation to fit um, the spline into this corner joint and I'll just kind of show there's the spline uh, before trimming it off. Use intersect with model to, on that spline to get, actually I'll just do this very quickly, because this one's a, um, an easy thing. If I open this one for editing, I'm just going to show, I made a copy so you can see what's going to happen here. Um, intersect faces with model. And here I've got, I can cut that off. And I've got the we have to do a little softening here and more cleanup, which I won't take the time to do. But that spline is cut now to fit. In a way, I can see, you know, you put the spline in and run a cutter around there, cut it off to match the inside of the uh, radius of that uh, curve. So move tool, another powerful thing. Um, use it to 
uh, make copies. You can use it for resizing things. When I drew this bed, the um, slats and the, all the vertical parts in the back are identical to the front ones. They're just longer. And so when I wanted to make a copy of, um, make the headboard, I drew the footboard first. I made a copy of, say, this post. I can make a copy of that and use the move tool to stretch it without deforming uh, the cloud lift or whatever you call that little bit of notch. I was thinking of the cloud lift as for the horizontals. But um, so there's a kind of a cool thing. Most user, new users will go to the scale tool for things like that, and that will deform all the geometry. And so that's, you know, the move tool is a better option. Um, flip, we talked about it a little bit. Um, it's a mirroring operation. We flip it along the, the red axis. I'm going to make another copy of that real quick. I'm not going to bother putting it in. Uh, and I'm going to rotate this one. This is another cool thing about the move tool, is you can rotate about the center. Those two uh, styles look identical. But when you want to change the length of the style, one of them goes the wrong way. Um, so that mirroring operation is just incredibly powerful. If it was uh, bookcase sides and you turn, you, let's say you've got one and it's got dados in one side, copy it over and you rotate it front to back, it looks right. Except that when you go to cut the rabbit in the, for the back, on the back edge of the left one, it ends up in the, um, on the front of the right one, which is something I do in the shop, but in SketchUp, it's pretty easy to avoid. So, is there a way to set the axis point on the one you rotated so that it would go in the same direction? No, you'd still have to, because if you change the axis orientation of one component, uh, it changes the axis orientation in all instances of the component, so that doesn't work. Um, dynamic components. Again, this is one I don't use a lot, but for people who are doing kitchen cabinets and things like that, and there's been some presentations on dynamic components, and there's going to be a long one today that uh, you'll learn how to make them if you haven't already done that. Uh, dynamic components are a really cool um, option. I have one that I use um, on a fairly regular basis, and here's um, just an example of where I might use this. By the way, this is a dresser I drew for Thomas Moser. Um, it probably doesn't have drawers that are made this way um, at, with a false front, but I'm just using this as my example. Um, so I've got a drawer box that drops in, kind of large there, but if we uh, it's all the way at the bottom. I want the component options. I've got this set up so that I can um, enter the, we'll enter the drawer height at 5.25, and I'll just update that right away. And you can see I've, my drawer box now fits the height, and the width of the opening is 29 and a quarter. And we can do the, in the interest of time, I won't do all of this, but I can set the drawer um, depth as well. But now I've got a, a drawer box that fits. It's set up for um, Blum undermount drawer glides. And this is for a client of mine that, um, uh, for a client of mine that uses um, drawer boxes that he orders. And so, the information in gray gives me the information to give him uh, so he can quote the drawers and order them. Um, I hate to do this, but I'm going to skip the rest of that because I want to show you just a couple of other things here. We we'll go back to. So you just use the dynamic component to change size, not to like open the drawer? Or like no, no. And because the whole thing is a component, and you know, I, if I need to show a drawer open, I just move, use the move tool and pull it out. Um, here's some, just some quick examples of some other things that I've done in SketchUp. 
This is a, a tool cabinet that I drew for Michael Pekovich um, and for fine woodworking. Um, one of the things that I find really powerful about SketchUp is that you can do something that looks like it was drawn by hand. It's pretty sloppy looking. That, the SketchUp model that that uh, drawing was made from is detailed down to joinery and screws and everything, and there's a plan document available from Fine. Actually, there's two plan documents available, uh, different uh, ones, for this tool cabinet. You can make a fairly detailed drawing, but if you want to show it to a client and you don't want them to see all the details, you can very easily, in SketchUp, make it look like it was drawn by hand. Um, or you can go the opposite end of that spectrum. I'm sure you've all seen um, the rendering application uh, people out there. You can make things look like photographs if you want. Um, what you use? I use Kerkithia. They don't have any, um, anybody here for representing them, but uh, Kerkithia? Kerkithia? Yeah. It, K E R K Y T H E A. And I use it. I don't use it very often, really, and I don't know that much about it, so I wouldn't presume to try to teach you how to use it. Um, it's free, and, um, but I can get what I want out of it, um, and it satisfies me, so um, this is... You did that hand sketchy thing through styles? Through the styles um, dialogue. I make a lot of styles, and there are a lot of them available on the Sketchication. Um, site uh, through their shop, and there are some available through sketchupartists.org. Um, this is the first page of, of a plan for that chair that I started out with the seat slats. Uh, this is done in layout. Um, here's the next page of that plan. And this is actually off of um, the full size um, which is printed on um, 48 by 36 inch paper. Um, but that, nearly everything is drawn in SketchUp. I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Couple more images, and I'm done. And thank you all for coming, and I knew this was gonna go this way. Thank you very much. <laughs>